finally have answers to some of Robert Mueller's questions. Barack Obama tries to take credit for the oil boom. Mississippi elects its first female senator. Lastly, there's a boy caught in the crossfires of leftist ideology. This is A Better World, and I'm your host, Luis Acevedo. Starting off today, we're going to be talking about the questions that have been answered by President Trump. So as we know, last week President Trump submitted answers to Robert Mueller's questions pertaining the Russia investigation, looking for collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign. Both of the questions that were shown today still prove that there is no collusion, and we have yet to have any evidence to back up the investigation that has been going on for two years. One of the questions that were answered today, and I'm getting this from the New York Post, and the title of this article is Trump to Mueller, Roger Stone Didn't Tell Me About WikiLeaks. And the title right there tells you one of the answers. So one of the answers states the following. President Trump said campaign advisor Roger Stone did not tell him about WikiLeaks and he wasn't made aware of a 2016 meeting at the Trump Tower between his son and Russia lawyers promising dirt on Hillary Clinton, a report said on Wednesday. So these were two of the questions that President Trump has answered and he has denied both of the questions. And Roger Stone also corroborates with this story. Although he does state that he had uh, met with Julia Assange, he states that President Trump had no knowledge of him meeting with the WikiLeaks founder or conversing with him, nor did he have any idea that the emails were going to be leaked out. Now, the emails that were leaked out were ones from the DNC. So WikiLeaks got hacked emails apparently from Russian hackers uh, that stole the DNC's emails and then they released it out to the public where we see a bunch of this controversial stuff come out. This is what the Mueller investigation is trying to pin President Trump with right here now is trying to see if there's any connection with President Trump knowing that the hack was going to take place and the release of these emails were going to take place as well. And if he was a part of the Russians hacking into the DNC, which, once again, we have no evidence that that took place. Roger Stone and President Trump are on the same page that he did. President Trump had no clue that the emails were going to be released, nor did Roger Stone tell him that he met with WikiLeaks whatsoever. Now, I want to add something about WikiLeaks because the investigation and the media are trying to pin down Paul Manafort in this mess too. As we talked about yesterday, they are claiming the special counsel investigation is that Paul Manafort was not being 100% honest with them and lied on a variety of subjects pertaining these criminal charges. Although he has pleaded guilty to every criminal charge presented against him and has forfeited everything he owns, I mean quite literally everything he owns, his house, his money, his life insurance, everything he owns, he has given up to these people and made a plea deal. Now, they have rescinded on it, as we talked about yesterday, because there were some speculations that he lied about certain answers, although they didn't talk about what he lied about in specific. So, the WikiLeaks documents that were released they are trying to tie that to Paul Manafort now, being that Roger Stone can't be tied down to it, President Trump can't be tied down to it. So now they're just throwing whatever they can and seeing where, you know, seeing what sticks. And now they're trying to get Paul Manafort. Although Paul Manafort vehemently denies ever meeting with anybody from WikiLeaks, as does the WikiLeaks founder deny meeting with him. Although this did not stop The Guardian from writing a fake article claiming that there was without a doubt a meeting between Paul Manafort and the WikiLeaks founder, not but a few hours later did they have to go back and rewrite the story and say that, well, sources tell us that they could have met, when before they were actually asserting with 100% certainty that they did meet. This is why. The mainstream media is called fake news. This is why President Trump calls them the enemy of the people. I'm not saying that rhetoric is good. 
whatsoever. I don't think it is. I don't think it's the right way to go about it. But he is not wrong in what he is calling them. I do think that there are some better names you can call them, saying that they're just being dishonest. I think if he keeps up with the fake news, dishonest media would be a better way to go about presenting their lies and how they're deceiving um, a bunch of people. They should. That's the way he should go about it. He shouldn't call them enemy of the people. Anyway, there is nothing but cooperation on all fronts when it comes to the Trump campaign story. The only way that anybody could believe that there is any invested, that there is any collusion actually going on, is if you truly believe an individual like Donald Trump, who is a loose cannon, is able to maintain one of the biggest conspiracy theories of all time, is able to make sure this happens and nobody will ever get caught. I doubt that is the case. I doubt it's the case. 100%. You don't think that we would have evidence by now after looking two years into this? We have none. None. The people who are in trouble had nothing to do with Russia. No evidence of Russia collusion whatsoever. But it does seem, or it does look like, the final report will be given out soon, which is good. So that way we can see exactly what's in the report. Although I don't think there's going to be anything substantial that's going to hurt President Trump on a legal front. What I do think will happen is that the final report will be more so a political tool that Democrats will use to try to win re-election in 2020. This is my opinion that all this final report is going to do is be a political tool for the Democrats. So we'll see exactly what happens as the report finishes and is released. Now, in other news, everybody's favorite president, Obama, cannot get out of the spotlight. And now he's wanting to take credit for the oil boom. This is what he said during um, a speech he was given. It looks like Rice University Baker Institute. This was on C-SPAM. So I'll go ahead and let you guys listen to it. It's only a minute long. This is what he says. And, you know, I, I just find it hard to believe that everybody calls President Trump a narcissist, but nobody calls Barack Obama a narcissist as well. I would say that they both are. And you'll find out why. If you don't know already. <laughs> I was extraordinarily proud of the Paris Accords because, uh, look, I know, you know, uh, you know, I, I know we're an oil country, and uh, we need American energy, and, and by the way, uh, American energy production. Uh, you wouldn't always know it, uh, uh, but you know, it went up every year I was president, um, and you know that whole suddenly America's like biggest oil producer and the biggest get uh, that was me people I just wanted you to so so uh, <laughs> it's a little like you know sometimes you go to Wall Street and folks would be grumbling about anti-business I said have you checked where your stocks were when I came in office where they are now what what are you talking what are you complaining about <laughs> just say thank you please uh, because just say thank you, please, when he's talking about the stock market. But we seem to forget that we had the slowest recovery under Barack Obama uh, coming out of the recession. He told us that about 1.8 is where the economy is going to be at forever. It's never going to get back up above 1.8. President Trump has proved that to be wrong. Now, I do have to admit that Barack Obama is 100% right in stating that oil, um, pri uh, oil production did go up Every year he was in office. Actually, they did break, you know, he did break some records while he was in office. Let's see here. So uh, this is an article from CNN Business. And so I'll read you a couple of the paragraphs. It says, the U.S. was pumping just 5.1 million barrels per day when Obama took office in 2009, January, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Fast forward to April, and U.S. Produ produced 8.9 million barrels per day. That's an incredible 74% increase. In fact, in 2015, the U.S. pumped 
the most oil in 43 years. The U.S. is now world's number one petroleum producer when you count not just crude, but also liquefied natural gases. If you limit the ranking to just crude of oil, the U.S. still comes third, just narrowly behind Saudi Arabia and Russia. Now, this article came out the 2016, July 1st, and so President Obama, former President Obama, is 100% correct to say that they did have major growth during his presidency. I do want to add that there are multiple oil companies, uh, their CEOs, that claim although the oil production did go up, they had uh, no help with President Obama's policies. Now, if we remember, President Trump was very strict on, I mean, Obama, sorry, was very strict on the environment. He didn't allow for the Keenstone XL pipes to be built. He stopped all or some um, Arctic and Atlantic drilling offshore. So these two things were not very friendly to the oil companies, also putting ridiculous emission standards in play. So while he is correct, there are people who dispute that he had anything to do with it. I'm not saying that he didn't have anything to do with the oil boom. I just wanted to point out that there are people who are far smarter than I when it comes to the particulars in the oil industry. I do want to add that the order in which Barack Obama put in place that didn't allow offshore drilling in the Arctic and Atlantic was actually overruled once President Trump got into office. He signed an executive order and was allowing that to take place during, you know, during and ongoing in his administration. And I also need to add that during uh, President Trump's short two years in office, the oil productions have also just went up. We have actually reached a high um, that has not been seen, I think, ever. So this is an article from the Daily Caller, and, it's, uh, and it states the following. U.S. oil production continues to break records this year, and the latest federal data shows crude output hit 11 million barrels a day in the previous week, with U.S. oil productions doubling in the last eight years. American Enterprise Institute economist Mark Perry noted the production milestone on Twitter, citing the U.S. Energy Information Administration. So this was a all-time record, um, all-time production record at the second, at two times the output of 5.5 million in 2010. So President Trump is without a doubt pumping out more oil than the Obama administration had did. Now, there is no dispute that Barack Obama was still participating in the continuous growth of the oil industry. So I just wanted to talk about this a little bit because a lot of right-wing sites have been dogging Obama right now and they've just been claiming that he's doing this so that way he can hear himself talk, which I kind of agree with. I kind of do because why would you say, you know, thank me, you should thank me. Thank me. I mean, come on. If you were that modest, humble guy everybody portrays you to be, that true valued person, you wouldn't say, say thank you. You would just be like, you know, well, we did this, and it's okay. It's okay. You know, we helped out. I don't need to thank you. I don't need any of that. That's, that's what you would think. I know President Trump wouldn't do that either. I'm not saying that he would. I'm not saying, because we know he wouldn't. <laughs> that's the last thing President Trump would do, um, is try to be humble and modest, because he's the complete opposite of that. Um, but President Trump and Barack Obama are not too different in that regard. And that's why we have a Republican version of Obama in office right now. So that's what's going on with Barack Obama uh, talking at Rice University about the oil production booming under him. Which, okay, you're right. You're right. But it's doing better under Trump. You know, you can't just keep saying that. Well, it's only doing good because of me. Well, then you're totally discrediting everything President Trump has done that contributes to the oil production uh, growth. This is not good. This is not good. And I say it's not good because there's no... The Democrats don't want the Republicans to do anything good. 
anything good that they do that doesn't side with their way of thinking is something evil or a result of their policy. That's the only thing, or, or racism, which I guess would tie into evil. But, yeah, that to me is a little sickening that, you know, you can't just say, well, you know, he's doing a good job. He, he can't say that. He can't say that, and he has to ask for thank yous. So, yeah. Now, moving on to something else. I'm not one for identity politics, but I figured I'd prove or make my point by introducing this article and introducing the next topic that I want to cover by stating Mississippi has elected its first female senator, and her name is Sydney Hyde-Smith. She just won the election today, so everything's finished up. This means that Republicans are hold a majority in the Senate of 53 to 47, where Democrats hold a majority in the House of 235 to 200. Now, the Democrats have picked up a large amount of seats, the largest ever seen since Watergate, and the Republicans have picked up a decent amount of seats in the Senate as well. So this is good news for Republicans that we are maintaining the Senate and that we actually picked up seats. So this is really good news. I just want to add the fact that during this campaign in Minnesota, I mean Mississippi, I'm sorry, the left continuously bashed uh, Sidney Smith, calling her a racist, calling her a bigot, trying to just completely destroy her character, did not once talk about her policies, none of that. And you know why she won, quite frankly, is because they couldn't keep her out of her out of their mouth. I don't even, you know, Mike Epsey, okay, I knew that who she was running against, but other than that, I didn't know, or didn't, I didn't know, I didn't hear much about him, other than when it came to the debate they had in which they tried to pin something racist on her when she made the statement. It was just a bad joke. It wasn't racist. She made a statement saying that if one of her supporters, I believe, she said, she said something like, if he was to invite me to a public hanging, I'd be in the front row with him. And then started laughing afterwards. The Democrats and the media took this as, oh my gosh, she's racist. This is insensitive. She's doing this in Mississippi. How can she do this when she knows their history? This is so wrong to joke about public hating. This wasn't racist at all. Not at all. She didn't say that I want to lynch black people. <laughs> she didn't say that. She didn't say anything about race whatsoever. The only people that ever talk about race are the Democrats. And then they also want to get mad at her because she put on a Confederate hat, not even with the flag, just what the soldiers wore, and one of the Confederate guns, she took a picture with that. And they said, oh my gosh, look at her, you know, celebrating Confederate history, da-da-da-da-da. And it's like, come on, man. Do you really think she has any, any real racism in her? There's no evidence of that. You're just trying to make far-fetched, inferences that hold no merit whatsoever. So it's pretty sickening. And of course, you're not going to hear about this being the first female senator in Mississippi. Why? Well, because she's a Republican, which is why I wanted to open up the intro with stating Mississippi has elected its first female senator. Because unfortunately, a lot of people don't know that. And with identity politics playing such a major role in our society today, which is yeah, it's nasty. <laughs> it really is. I just figured I'd point out that since the left is always talking about race equality and gender equality and wanting to get more women in the Senate, more people of color in the Senate, more people of color in the House of Representatives, and more women. But as soon as, you know, a state elects their first female, they drop the whole ID, uh, identity politics right away because they're of a different ideological persuasion. So... That's what's going on. Congratulations to her for winning the senatorship over there. But it shouldn't really come of any surprise because President Trump won Mississippi uh, by a nearly 18-point margin in the 2016 election. So it should have been pretty obvious that they would have uh, picked up that seat over there in Min uh, Mississippi. Although it did go off into a runoff, uh, just basically meaning nobody got the majority of votes. So anyway, so now Republicans have 53 seats in the... Uh, 
the Senate, which is good. So the last article we're going to talk about today is an article from the Daily Wire that was originally reported from the Federalist. And it is titled, Mom Says Six-Year-Old Son... Oh. Sorry about this. This. All right. So... Mom says six-year-old son is transgender. Dad disagrees. Now he might lose his son. So what's going on here is that this um, six-year-old kid, when he goes with his mother, his mother dresses him up in female clothes and calls him, uh, I believe, uh, Laura. And when he's with his dad, he dresses up in boy clothing and goes by his name, James. Now... His mother took him to a therapist who diagnosed him with gender dysphoria and suggested that they start going through a transition period. The kid's six years old and they want to start giving him hormones to hormone blockers and start going through a transition process for him to go in to become a female. He's six years old. The dude doesn't know. The little kid doesn't know anything about life. He doesn't even know who he is. He doesn't know anything whatsoever. Whatsoever. And what's more, and what's most irritating, is there are several firsthand accounts of the little boy James when he's with his father, acting nothing like a girl and acting only like a boy, only wanting to dress in boy clothing. Clothing gets upset every time his mom puts girls' clothing on him, like fights her on it, and yet the mother has made it. So that way, the father cannot talk to him on legal grounds when it comes to his sexuality and gender from a scientific, scientific, legally he cannot speak to his son about science on sex. Legally he cannot do that or on religious grounds, which is completely egregious. This is just wrong on so many levels. This little boy is going to be messed up for years to come more than likely. Because there is clear evidence that he doesn't suffer from gender dysphoria, being that there are first-hand accounts stating from family, friends, and people at his church saying that he acts like a boy, he dresses like a boy, he identifies as James, he doesn't identify as his female name. And when he is with his mother going to the therapist, they refer to himself as Laura, but when he's with his father, he refers to himself as James. So the therapist has even stated that there's inconsistencies in his confusion with gender. But the mother completely disregards that and actually is trying to sue the father and prevent him from seeing the kid unless he pays for visits and basically is trying to get him in trouble for child abuse for not accepting their son to be transgender, although their son is not consistently transgender. He identifies as a boy when he's with his father, but identifies as a girl when he's with his mom. That's very suspicious. And you know what? It wouldn't surprise me whatsoever if this mom is just a sick person and wanted a daughter and started dressing up her son as a little girl. I personally, personally know people who have done that to their sons. I do. And it is a real thing, and it is disgusting. It is truly disgusting, and I believe that that's exactly what's going on here. So we'll see where this goes as the court case continues and the story unfolds, but that's what's going on right now, and it is completely wrong on so many levels. The dad can't even talk science with his son about sex, not saying that the kid will understand what he's saying with science, but he can't talk about what is factual with his son. The courts are enforcing him to lie to his son. That is morally wrong. So, and the mom's trying to get him for child abuse. It should be the other way around is what it seems. But, this is just sad for the kid. Six years old. Six years old and he has to go through this. That's just horrible. That's really horrible. And I hope, I hope this doesn't mess him up for the rest of his life. And I hope and pray that he can be in a better situation very soon. And, yeah. So, that's what we have for the news today. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all had a wonderful Wednesday, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Peace.